Pad B's Tower 2 is fully stacked, dramatically changing the skyline once again. But that's not all. Over at Pad A, there's been a crazy amount of work going on on Tower 1 and its chopsticks to ready them for a potential catch on Flight 5. And on top of all of that, this week SpaceX began the final stacking of the first next generation Starship, that's Ship 33, and it was fully visible in all its glory during the operation. Howdy Tank Watchers, I'm Jack Byer for NSF and this is your Starbase Update. Let's start off the week by talking about some of the hardware and test articles that are currently floating around Starbase. This week, Test Tank 16 was lifted into the structural test stand at the Massey Outpost. The stand can be used to simulate the pressure on both the tank walls and the aft dome of the test tank. Test Tank 16 is in the critical path for Starship version 2 testing. It will be used to verify the integrity of the structure for the aft section of the version 2 of the ship. While Test Tank 16 is at Massey's, we're expecting it to undergo some sort of proof testing, either ambient, cryogenic, or both, to verify that there's no leaks and everything is working as expected under flight loads. And later in the week, we in fact saw a cap installed on the test article so that the stand could apply loads onto the tank during such a test. The question now becomes, will SpaceX merely test this article to flight levels, or will they test it to destruction and we'll get a pop as we have seen sometimes in the past? Stay tuned to Starbase Live and our future videos because we're all going to find out together. Next, let's check in with our favorite construction site, and of course I'm talking about the new office building. Over here, multiple levels are being outfitted at the same time, and it seems an elevator or staircase area is now visible between the levels. You can also see clear as day how rapid the progress has been on the connection between the office building and the Star Factory itself. Speaking of the Star Factory, the front area of the building is having more work done inside of it, and as you can see, most of the main building now appears complete. As we established in the past few weeks, the Star Factory is very much already in use, but the building has a huge amount of floor space that is only just now, or still hasn't yet come online. As we peek inside the Star Factory, we can see a fresh new nose cone that's looking really good and smooth with some fresh tiles installed on top. We can also see the new ablative layer that's installed underneath those tiles. Neat! From another angle, we can see that the body of this nose cone already has way more tiles. It's always cool to see the build quality of these vehicles improving over time, and now that SpaceX is building them inside the controlled environment of a factory versus a tent on a sandbar in a random place in Texas, it seems, at least to me, that those build quality improvements are accelerating. Another very interesting piece of hardware floating around is the version 2 ship transfer tubes that were spotted by Mary being moved into Mega Bay 2 for installation on Ship 33 this week. Keep in mind that not everything you see here are the transfer tubes. There's also tooling for installation. It's unclear why this new transfer tube design has different tubes for each RVAC engine, but it certainly looks cool. Speaking of current Starships, Ship 31's heat shield replacement is continuing along as SpaceX works to get it ready for Starship Flight 6. Hopefully, Ship 30's heat shield replacement works perfectly on Starship Flight 5, that way SpaceX doesn't have to completely tear down Ship 31's heat shield a second time. This week, Mary also caught an increasingly rare and special treat, and that was the delivery of four Raptor engines. Specifically, they were Raptors number 349, 373, 348, and 366. These serial numbers betray that these are still the older version 2 Raptors, and not the new version 3 Raptor that SpaceX recently showed off, but that makes sense. It's expected that it'll be a while until we see these insanely upgraded engines in Boca Chica. After all, version 3 of Raptor is not expected to be used before version 2 of Starship, and the fact that the one that we have seen is serial number 1 means that SpaceX likely has a lot more work to do testing and manufacturing these engines before they even think about putting them on a Starship. Speaking of version 2 of the ship, this week the aft section for Ship 33 was moved into Mega Bay 2 in preparations for stacking with the rest of the vehicle. And you know what this means, right? All of Ship 33's parts are now in Mega Bay 2. We are this close to version 2 of Starship. All they have to do is weld those two parts together, roll it out to Massey's for some proof testing, then roll it back to the production site uh, for engine installation, then roll it back to Massey's for a static fire, then back to the production site to finish its heat shield. Uh, okay. And it, I guess it needs aft flaps? Did I say aft flaps? Okay, so there's a lot of work to be done left on Ship 33, but either way, it's really cool to see them on the cusp 
of a full stack SAR ship version 2. In terms of differences between ship version 1 and ship version 2, the biggest one perhaps, besides the flaps anyways, is the addition of a single ring. A version 1 ship consisted of 20 rings, now we're up to 21 on ship 33. Thanks to the stacking operations, you can see the three supply lines to the three vacuum raptor engines on the bottom of the ship sticking out from the bottom of the upper part of the stack here. This is a change to how the propellants were distributed in previous versions of Starship. The new forward flaps are also very visible here, and you can see them equipped with tiles and attached to the ship in their new location. In terms of other changes between version 1 and version 2, remember the external stringers that were tested on the cursed and universally hated Ship 26? Well, Ship 33 at least features an homage to that feature, with some large external stringers being visible on the forward nose cone area. This could have been done to patch a bad weld in that area, but I honestly have no idea. Ask Alex, or Ryan Weber. The forward section of the ship also features the payload bay and payload bay door that will be used to deploy Starlink satellites, and it really does feel like Ship 33 might be the first ship to do that once SpaceX gets to that point. You can see the door has a newer design that we've talked about in past videos, and again, everything just looks more refined. If you want a quick refresher on everything that's different between version 1 and version 2 of ship, at least that we can spot, be sure to check out Starbase Update from a few weeks back, where we went over everything in excruciating detail. But one thing we were not able to talk about then, because we hadn't seen it yet, is the aft section of Ship 33. Un unless you count Test Tank 16, which... Eh. You can see the Ship QD right at the center, and if you had any doubts about this part, look to the lower left where you can see it says Ship Aft Cart. On the left and right side of the aft section, you can already see the attachment areas for the flaps. You can also see how the engine chill pipe is attached to that area, and we expect the engine chill vent to come out of the bottom of this section now. This is a huge step forward for the Starship program. Again, this thing does not have engines yet, and it'll probably be quite some time until it does. But either way, being on the cusp of having a fully stacked version 2 ship really goes to show just how far ahead SpaceX is thinking with its program. It is hard to predict how long the downtime will be between the different Starship versions flying, if any, but hopefully having Ship 33 this far along will help SpaceX close or eliminate the gap between Ships 31 and 33 flying. Alright, now let's move here to the launch site and focus our attention on the chopsticks, where SpaceX has begun a series of upgrades to prepare them for a catch attempt on Flight 5. And these upgrades are pretty dang significant, as you're about to see. This week saw more of the reinforcement work that has been ongoing as of late. This is illustrated well by the fact that there are about a gazillion lifts and cranes working on the chopsticks. Here, we see work being done on the reinforcement of the welds. This structural reinforcement was apparently deemed necessary so as to not completely destroy the chopsticks with the attempted landing of Booster 12. SpaceX must have identified this as a weak spot in the system, and hey, that's good news. I don't think any of us want to see a chopstick failure during a booster catch. In this shot, we can see a whole bunch of the welds that are reinforced now. Look at the number of workers on different weld lines at the same time, with one, two, three, four, five, six different lifts. This certainly isn't the kind of work that'll be completed in a day or two, and from what we've been able to see so far, we expect this work to take about one to two weeks, so there's yet another data point for you in terms of when Flight 5. You can see more of the reinforcements attached to the weld lines now as they progress with the upgrades. That's not all for the chopsticks this week though, we also saw some chopsticks movement, with them lifting up and out of their resting position. Then we saw some sideways movement, checking out all axes the chopsticks can move into. Then, the right stick even performed a full opening, and the chopsticks went down again. From time to time, it probably makes sense for SpaceX to ensure that all this reinforcement work hasn't damaged anything important on the chopsticks, so that's a likely answer for what this movement was all about. The chopsticks also saw some attention on their main holding frame. This is most likely the most exposed area to the fire and energy of Super Heavy during landing, so some work here is to be expected. Once more, this really shows that SpaceX is committed to a catch attempt on Starship Flight 5 and they really want to prepare the chopsticks as best they can. A few hours later, we can see several of these metal frames now attached to the chopstick. These metal frames will hold the padding that is already installed on the other chopstick that will hopefully make a catch a uh, catch and less of a collision. Next up on Tower 1, we saw some work this week on the ship quick disconnect arm, where it seems one of the GSC pipes has been replaced. Or at least the shielding of such parts. The exact details are hard to see. A big group of workers then worked on the QD, so it seems some maintenance and repair work was due. Work on the ship QD didn't stop there though. Crews on the other side of the QD are working on the main structure of the ship QD. Which, by the way, is a job that Adrian, who wrote this script, 
totally could not do. That's what he wrote in the script. I, I mean, I, I would totally be able to do it. Lastly for pad A, we saw some work being done this week on the booster quick disconnect, specifically on the hood of it, which protects its more sensitive bits during a launch. All right, now it's tower two time. Let's bring you all up to speed on the construction of Starbase's second tower. At the beginning of the week, we saw a group of workers transporting the final tower module down Highway 4. After weeks of covering this tower, it was now time for the final act. It's seriously impressive how fast SpaceX was able to throw this tower together. And now here it stands, in all its glory, completely changing the vibe of the launch site forever. Module 9 is easily identifiable as the last section because you can easily see the area for the drawworks cables and pulleys. Also, SpaceX made it very easily for us to identify it based on the giant Module 9 sign imprinted on the legs. After a short transport, the module then arrived at the launch site and was staged there ahead of its lift. In the daylight, the massive CC-8800-1 crane was then moved to the final tower segment for stacking. Of course, the hook needs to be hooked up to the load spreader first in preparation for the lift, but you know this process already from all the previous tower segments. In the background, we also see ongoing work at the other foundations for Pad B, as well as ground preparation work behind the tower. I always love this shot. It really clearly shows the similarities and differences between the two towers. While Tower 1 is quite a bit darker, the new tower is pretty bright. It's unclear if there will be a painting session on the new tower, or if the second tower just has a different coating, or if it just hasn't had time to patina in the same way as Tower 1 yet. Some last minute work on the tower section was also caught by our Starbase live cameras. Three of what looked to be wall panels were received by a worker here and then installed on the upper part of the final tower section. Workers continued to install railing on the final tower segment. Maybe this was always planned, or maybe it was just a last minute adjustment because it's certainly much easier to install the railing on the ground than lifting it all the way up the tower and installing it there. SpaceX really took their time to prepare this last segment before the lift, with more polishing and welding being performed at night. And inside of the tower, more parts of the elevator shaft were also installed, as SpaceX probably wants to get that done before the cap is on it. We already saw the elevator inside the tower moving, so it seems to be in use, but of course, it needs to go all the way to the top. And finally, it was time for some action, with Module 9 being moved next to the crane, which was already ready with the load spreader installed. It did take a little bit of time to attach the load spreader, as it seemed SpaceX had a few alignment issues and took their time to do this right. In the end, the day ended without the lifting rig attached. And then, finally, lifting time. Module 9 was in the air early in the morning, and in a very fast operation, SpaceX lifted this final module on top of the second orbital launch tower, completing the two towers at Starbase. You can see the army of workers waiting on every leg of the tower to weld and attach this last module in place as soon as it's dropped on the pillars of the existing eight ones. And cross segments were also lowered to allow attaching to the previous segment in multiple ways. One of the biggest jobs of the tower is of course weight load distribution, so a lot of cross segments make sure the weight is properly distributed throughout the tower. And with that, this stage of Tower 2's build is complete. Of course, it's missing a lot of features before it becomes a fully-fledged orbital pad, like the chopsticks, the chopsticks carriage, the drawworks, the OLM, the flame trench, and a whole bunch of other outfitting and things I'm probably forgetting. So our tracking of the construction of Pad B is not coming to an end, we just get to mark another milestone. At the top of the new tower, you can see the drawworks pulleys already installed next to the American flag, signaling that the tower is fully at height. Another neat thing was the addition of a SpaceX tweet that confirmed second launch tower stacked as the newest addition to Starbase. The neat bonus is, it not only provides us with a cool shot of the second tower, but also a night shot of the Star Factory, as well as a drone shot of the village and production site, showing the immense scale of the Star Factory once again. Of course, after the two towers, everybody wants to know, when is the return of the Methane King? And the sad answer is, we don't know. SpaceX did try to show that they're ready by posting on Twitter and saying that they are only waiting for regulatory approval, but the answer is most likely that for a catch attempt, they have some more work to be done. I mean, if they're going for a catch on Flight 5, it certainly seems like they have some more work to be done. Neither the FAA or SpaceX have provided any kind of significant update this week that would help us refine our timeline, so it's very much still a game of wait and see. My current guess, if you want to know, is currently second half of September to first half of October. Somewhere in that four week time span makes sense. One cool thing we did get to see this week was the addition of the decals to Ship 30. And not just the normal ones that we've seen, 
This week, we also saw them add a Mecha Godzilla to Ship 30, signifying that they are, in fact, for sure, 100% for realsies this time, going for a catch attempt on Flight 5. But why put the sticker on the ship? They're not catching the ship. They're catching the booster. It doesn't make sense. Besides those cool and also kind of infuriating stickers, nothing else happened, at least that we could see, on the Flight 5 vehicles this week. But stay tuned, because as soon as we see anything or have any indication in terms of when Flight 5 is going to happen, you'll know too. All right, that's it for this week. Thanks for watching, and as always, don't forget, be excellent to each other.